I am thrilled to have the honor of introducing ex-evangelical writer and thinker Chrissy Stroop, the first speaker in our new summer series. Chrissy is without a doubt one of the brightest minds in journalism and among the most interesting new voices in the secular movement. She has a PhD in modern Russian history from Stanford University, and her work has appeared in scholarly journals, as well as Foreign Policy, Religion Dispatches, Playboy, Day Magazine, The Moscow Times, Eurasianet, and I could keep going. Chrissy's work is notable for drawing on her background as a historian and as an ex-evangelical to provide some of the most fascinating analyses of current events related to secularism and authoritarian religion. But that's not all. Chrissy is also a Twitter influencer with more than 50,000 followers. She is the creator of the viral hashtags Christian Alt Facts, Expose Christian Schools, and of course, Empty the Pews. Empty the Pews is also the name of the anthology she co-edited with Lauren O'Neill, which won the EOS Award and was reviewed in the Washington Post. This page turner of an essay collection includes New York Times bestselling writers, academics, influential bloggers, and even artists who come from all backgrounds and walks of life, but are united by one simple fact. They left authoritarian religion and are now speaking out. Without further ado, I'm happy to turn things over to Christy Stroop for what will undoubtedly be an eye-opening talk. Thank you so much, Tom, for that very kind introduction. Um, so for tonight's presentation, I've uh, made a few slides and I've been told to start by uh, talking just a little bit about the power of social media, uh, what hashtags are, how they work, what are their potentialities and pitfalls. And then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about uh, how hashtags can be used to, um, to help certain kinds of people who are often ignored by the media uh, like in my case, ex-evangelicals or other kinds of ex-fundamentalists or people from, you know, hardline, uh, high-demand religious backgrounds to gain collective visibility and um, thereby to possibly change the national conversation around things like religion and secularism. Uh, so that's kind of something that I've been trying to do with hashtags with, with uh, some success for several years. So tonight I'm going to take you through an example of that. Uh, and then we'll also talk about the history of the Empty the Pews hashtag and how it became a book and so forth. And uh, then I'm looking forward to chatting with Tom about uh, related issues and uh, to taking your questions. So let's get started here. Uh, to start things off, uh, let me just go into you know, some basic details about what a hashtag is, where they came from. Um, I'll be happy to make these slides available if people want them so uh, you, know, you can follow these links and things like that. But uh, there's a whole website that's dedicated to the history of the hashtag. And basically, what a hashtag is, you put the, um, the pound sign in front of some words, and then that becomes a searchable uh, sort of phrase. Uh, it's, it's a tag that you can put on, say, a tweet or a post on Instagram, and people who are interested in being a part of certain social media communities on those sites can then search for that tag and connect with others who are interested in the same thing. Um, so social media has been hailed as having great democratic and revolutionary potential since it kind of really came on the scene with Web 2.0. Um, but since that time, of course, there has been some disillusionment uh, with social media as well, because particularly uh, since the 2016 election, we've understood how social media can be manipulated and hashtags can be manipulated uh, and created or exploited um, by people who want to use them for nefarious purposes to stir up division, to spread disinformation and that sort of thing. Um, Twitter was, was really a powerful thing in the Arab Spring protests in terms of helping people share information. Uh, on the ground and helping the protesters organize. But of course, that can also be thwarted by um, authoritarian governments who censor the web. So, you know, hashtag is definitely not uh, the end all and be all of activism or advocacy, but it does still have, I think, powerful uses for advocacy if we use it in a smart way. So it's not mere quote unquote slacktivism, right? If you, if you use it in a certain way. Um, so, you know, I'm not trying to use hashtags to organize an out and out revolution or anything like that, but I do believe, and I've seen it work, we can still use hashtags for something more modest, uh, which is that if you get a hashtag trending, which means a bunch of people are tweeting it at the same time, 
And so it will then show up in Twitter on you know the trends. And if you get into the top trends in particular, a lot of people see it, will see it, a lot of people will start interacting with it. And that can lead to getting media coverage. And in turn, if you get media coverage for a hashtag like empty the pews or expose Christian schools or one that I did not come up with, but one that's been quite powerful uh, is hashtag church too, uh, which the, the creators of that hashtag, uh, Hannah Posh and Emily Joy credited both me too and empty the pews as the inspiration for it. Uh, you know, you can start to change the national conversation. If you change the conversation, then, it also becomes possible to change political possibilities, right? And ultimately, uh, what I hope to do with this is to gain a hearing, a voice for uh, ex-evangelicals in the public sphere, and of course also for secular Americans in general. Um, I think that when journalists do journalism on religion and society, and particularly when they are looking at high control groups like uh, cons America's conservative, mostly white evangelical Protestants, they should include not just evangelical voices themselves, and actually our media situation is even worse than that. At the New York Times and the Washington Post, most of the people who cover evangelicals are evangelicals, and they really whitewash the authoritarianism of the community. Um, it's very difficult to get the gatekeepers to care about this, but if you have a hashtag that is trending, you know, with hundreds of thousands of tweets, then you can indeed get their attention. Um, so hopefully that um, sort of gives you a sense of what hashtags are and how they can be used. If, if not, uh, you know, don't panic at this point. I'm going to show you an example of a different hashtag, specifically what happened uh, when I created the hashtag Expose Christian Schools, um, and then uh, I'll get to talking about empty the pews. So here's a problem that probably a lot of us as secular Americans care about. Um, there was an expose, an in-depth deep dive, great piece of journalism published by Rebecca Klein in Huffington Post uh, sometime back in 2017 um, she did contact me before she published this to um, consult with me because uh, she does not firsthand know what Christian schools are like. But Huffington Post, they had, she's the education reporter at Huffington Post, and they had the resources behind her for her to do sort of a big survey of the kind of um, curricula that are used in Christian schools and the kind of alternative facts and far right wing positions, racism and sexism and so forth that they teach to children. Um, and so they've got these charts, they've got this fantastic data and she wrote a really excellent piece about it in which she highlighted also the plight of some people who grow up evangelical are sent to these kind of fly by night, barely regulated church schools and come out without the kind of education that allows them to live independently. It can be a really, really damaging thing. And more, uh, maybe more to the point in terms of things that we can fight politically, uh, although we're losing this battle at the moment, uh, in the United States, there are approximately 2,000 uh, K through 12 schools, that is elementary and secondary schools, um, and, there, and quite possibly more, uh, that are receiving state or federal and or federal funding to uh, teach these sorts of things which are simply factually not true. Uh, so when you see a problem like this and you see certain statistics and, and that kind of stuff that, you know, Rebecca Klein was able to get for this report in the Huffington Post, uh, you know, you might think, okay, th that's a problem, that's, that's an issue, uh, but maybe you won't connect with it on a deep level unless you also can put a human face behind it, unless there are some human stories. Uh, because people think in narratives. I mean, as much as we in the secular community often... Uh, sort of pat ourselves on the back, and, it, and it's not wrong to do so, for valuing data and valuing actual facts, um, a statistic is, is less moving than a personal story. And we've seen examples in the past of how uh, smart campaigns with personal stories have changed public opinion on things like LGBTQ rights, which of course is also very important to me. So I, and in the context of this, I mean, probably many of you have read uh, the report from American Atheist 2019 secular survey, I have that in the back of my mind as well, because that report, I think, very effectively combined uh, people's anecdotes, their um, qualitative replies to the survey, uh, with the data that they got from the survey, and uh, that is 
you know, a formula for effective advocacy and for effectively changing public opinion. And if uh, a certain constituency like secular Americans or ex-evangelicals doesn't have, um, you know, access immediately to uh, major outlets, can't get through the gatekeepers, sometimes a way to get their attention uh, can precisely be to use social media and to use hashtag activism. So let's kind of look at how this can work. First of all, um, you know, speaking of stories, this is fourth grade me. That's, uh, that's my fourth grade class picture uh, next to a, I guess you would call this uh, an, an essay on a fourth grade level, a fourth grade writing assignment, uh, in which we all had to write about why creationism is true, right? <laughs> Basically, uh, all the children in our class were required to regurgitate, regurgitate a bunch of anti-science facts. Um, so, you know, I wrote something like, well, I'll, I'll read you some of what I wrote here just so you get the idea. Um, first of all, I want to talk about the law of entropy because yeah, in fourth grade, I really understood that. It basically says anything organized tends to become disorganized after a while. Take your bedroom. You clean it up time after time, but eventually it will be messy again. If this law is true, how could so much order come out of chaos? And so on and so forth. Creation is talking points, right? Even worse on the next page, which is not shown on this slide. Oh, and yeah, they made us write in cursive, <laughs> which is kind of out of date now. But I, I, uh, I repeated the, the lie that I was taught that Darwin converted on his, death, which is on his deathbed and repudiated his own ideas. So how could evolution be true, right? And then I concluded with, and if that's not enough, here are some Bible verses. <laughs> because this is how they taught us to think and reason. And this is highly, highly irresponsible. Um, this, is, this is far and away not the most traumatizing thing that happened to me in the um, context of growing up in a high demand uh, Christian community where our entire social world was basically church and Christian school. I was taken to an anti-abortion protest at age 11, uh, things like that. Um, but you know, this is this is still bad. And when you put something like this next to Rebecca Klein's data, you know, you have a formula for changing public opinion. So let's look at how we did basic, basically that uh, with the hashtag exposed Christian schools uh, in early 2019. So about a year ago, we did this campaign. Um, and it started kind of completely by accident. I mean, I just saw that, um, not only that Karen Pence, uh, the second lady, had returned to the Christian school where she was an art teacher before to teach art classes there again, and it's an explicitly anti-LGBTQ Christian school. I mean, they basically all are. Uh, so, you know, they will not have any LGBTQ people on their staff. Uh, they discriminate against queer students um, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, this is a really repressive environment. It's exactly the kind of environment that I was raised and educated in. Um, oddly enough, my school, though, was also college prep and even had AP biology, um, which was taught badly, but I still got a five on the exam. So there's a whole range here, right? I actually was able to get uh, enough of a decent education in my Christian school to get out, go to college, and even go to grad school. But other people have it even worse and, and don't get that. But in any case, these these schools are repressive across the board, you know, whether they're hardcore fundamentalists or or fundy light. So anyway, I saw this about Karen Pence, right? And then, uh, of course, she was roundly criticized for that because you can't represent all Americans if you're putting yourself in a situation where you're taking an explicitly anti-LGBTQ stance. And then I noticed how some people in uh, on Twitter and in conservative media like Vice President Mike Pence and David French of National Review uh, were just very petulantly pushing back uh, against the criticism and saying, you know, how dare people criticize the second lady for just being wonderful and teaching at a Christian school. So um, I tweeted the hashtag exposed Christian schools just on, on the spot. And then I asked a few people to help see if we could get it going. And it trended sort of beyond my wildest dreams. I mean, at, even at the height of its trend, I don't know exactly because Twitter makes it very hard to track this unless you just kind of see it in the moment. Um, but I don't think Empty the Pews ever trended with anything close to 200,000 tweets, although it certainly has tweets in the thousands and I think the tens of thousands at this point. Um, so, but Exposed Christian Schools got uh, 200,000 tweets in just a couple of days. Um, and 
it did help us to break through with the message of there's a, there's a lot of wrong things that happen at Christian schools. Uh, but unfortunately, there is still uh, a kind of fear in the so-called liberal press or the mainstream press, places like the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, of the right-wing outrage machine. Uh, the right-wing outrage machine very much went into motion around exposed Christian schools. And uh, the New York Times reporter who had tweeted that he was going to um, be writing about this and was interested in hearing about people's experiences uh, got attacked by trolls who organized on a website called 4chan, which is like an absolute you know, cesspit, like one of the darkest, nastiest corners of the, of the web. Uh, they actually get on there and they plot and they come up with uh, ways to try to influence social media uh, to basically to harm marginalized groups. So I was kind of naive and also kind of overwhelmed as the hashtag was blowing up so much and some journalists wanted to talk to me. Um, and uh, anyway, as you can see, we got uh, a report in the Associated Press, which I think was pretty good um, overall, but I feel really bad about what happened to Dan Levin because he was like, could you, you know, advise me on some people that I could possibly talk to uh, about this hashtag and their experiences? And I said, well, why don't you just tweet that you're looking for sources? I had no idea that, you know, he was going to be bombarded with literally 10,000 replies from trolls who had organized on 4chan, who probably most of whom didn't even go to Christian schools, but who were insisting that Christian schools are great. And why is he attacking Christianity? And of course, being anti-Semitic and making a lot of remarks about him being a Jewish reporter who was supposedly attacking Christianity. And uh, the hashtag itself also uh, was featured on Fox and Friends twice, but they didn't mention uh, where it came from or what it was really used for. So it wasn't hard, you know, to find the original tweet that started it if, if they wanted to. Um, but they didn't want to represent this hashtag as representing the serious concerns being raised by survivors who had attended Christian schools. They wanted to represent it as a liberal conspiracy. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, I, I feel kind of ambivalent about how this turned out. Uh, but I have to say, I do think it's a real victory that we got coverage in uh, the Washington, I'm sorry, in the Associated Press and in the New York Times, even though because of this right-wing attack, the New York Times coverage was heavily watered down. But, um, and here on this slide, you can see Elizabeth Diaz tweeting the New York Times piece on exposed Christian schools. And you can also see uh, a couple of the tweets, right? This one that went pretty viral about having um, slave day, where students were auctioned off to be slaves for a day. Um, in a Christian school as just like a fun fundraiser. You know, these are these are very, very white Christian schools, generally speaking. Um, and here's an example of a spiritual counselor uh, outing a gay student. Um, here is uh, a woman tweeting about things that she was taught in her Christian school that I'm quoting, gay people are evil, being black is from the mark of Cain, the Pope is the antichrist, it's the end of the world, sexual purity, and men have dominion over women. So there were a whole lot of stories out there like this, some of them very powerful. Um, and there were stories of, you know, direct abuse and some people even calling out and naming names. Um, so it was, it was a powerful phenomenon, despite not having the impact it could have had because to some extent, the so-called liberal media left us in the lurch. Although again, not not entirely. I mean, it is it is great that we got into the New York Times at all and the Associated Press, but the far uh, the right wing media they did a lot more with this hashtag. So you know, some lessons learned from this have to do with I guess both cautionary tales and potential for future campaigns. This was not a planned campaign. It was just a spontaneous thing that became a huge phenomenon, and empty the pews was like that as well. But I, I would definitely like to strategize with some people in the future about using hashtags effectively and kind of plan it a little bit more in advance. I very much just kind of have learned this stuff by, by doing. But okay, so now let's talk about the history of um, Empty the Pews a little bit. Uh, Empty the Pews actually dates back further than exposed Christian schools, uh, about a year and a half. Uh, it started about a year and a half before exposed Christian schools and it trended and got some media coverage, but it never trended as much. And so it didn't become kind of overwhelming to me. Um, and I think it has accomplished a lot of good. 
So I coined Empty the Pews in August 2017 after Trump's very fine people on both sides, you know, there are very fine Nazis remarks after the Unite the Right rally at Charlottesville. Uh, and I looked to see what evangelical leaders like Franklin Graham and Jerry Falwell Jr. were saying about this on their social media, if anything at all. And mostly there was silence. And I was really angry at, um, you know, the complicity of the white evangelicals that I grew up with in uh, Donald Trump's racism and, uh, you know, even their support for it, um, not just through silence, but sometimes through um, speaking up on his behalf. Like uh, Pastor Robert Jeffress of First Baptist Church Dallas, uh, who is also famous because his choir performed a so-called hymn called Make America Great Again. Um, he went on uh, Pat Robertson's network, Christian Broadcasting Network, and literally said that Trump doesn't have a racist bone in his body. And so I was like, you know, how do we respond to this when evangelicals are utterly impervious to criticism? And I was just kind of riffing along these lines on Twitter. I was tweeting things and thinking, not so much thinking out loud as thinking through tweet. And I had the thought, you know, they, they deflect or they ignore criticism, but they are actually afraid of losing the youth, which they are. Uh, because as we know, the um, non-religious demographic in America is between a quarter and a fifth of the population now, and it has been rising rapidly since the 1990s, and they're afraid of declining church attendance numbers. And even huge denominations like the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, uh, they've, they've typically in recent decades been able to hold up their numbers through adult conversions and through immigration, but uh, even their raw numbers are declining now. So they're not just losing some of the kids, uh, but replacing them with adult converts. Their, their raw numbers are in decline, which is, which is huge. Um, so yeah, I was like, a hashtag like empty the pews used as a rallying cry, encouraging people who are in churches that are supporting Donald Trump and supporting racism and no longer uh, feel like in good conscience they can be a part of those churches to share their stories of leaving those churches, uh, use it as a protest. And I kind of expanded it then and said, why don't we also just anyone who's left, you know, a particular church over bigotry and intolerance, why don't you share your story? And a lot of people did. And um, I did some uh, radio and podcast interviews about this at the time, and it was covered on the um, uh, liberal Christian website, Sojourners, and, and things like that. So it had a it has a, had a positive impact, uh, and I also framed it as not explicitly anti-religious or anti-theist as such, but as something that anyone who's left a racist or bigoted church, anti-LGBTQ church, misogynistic church, uh, can use. Uh, even if they decided to go to a better church or they decided to become non-religious, you know, as their own conscience dictates, this is a hashtag that I said I want to use specifically to protest those kind of toxic churches because some religion is better and, and healthier uh, than others, you know. So I didn't want to alienate progressive Christians. I felt that we needed to unite with them in this. And some of them at first really didn't like the hashtag because they thought that uh, there's no way to see it as not anti-religious or anti-Christian, but many pastors actually came around to it. Um, and so I think I think that's a positive thing, too, because I do believe that we as secular Americans uh, should consider the significance of pluralism in a democratic society and just for politically pragmatic reasons as well, how we can build coalitions and, and work with uh, religious people of different confessions who do share our values. To me, shared values are always going to be more important than, than shared beliefs. Um, so over time, this hashtag became just kind of a community marker and it's still tweeted every day. It may only be in the, in the tens of tweets, but it's out there because people go searching for it, people use it. Uh, and so, you know, let's say that you wanna find the latest cases of abuse by priests on Twitter you could search for this hashtag has probably been used to highlight the, those things because it often is. Um, and anyway, then I'm, I'm gonna transition now to talking about the book. Uh, my co-editor and friend Lauren O'Neill and I had started talking about doing an anthology to kind of use the, the power of stories to, uh, to get people's attention with why 
so many young Americans are leaving Christianity. Uh, we started talking about it, I think, as far back as 2012. Um, and we really didn't start working on it until 2016. And then late last year, it finally came out. It was a long-term uh, labor of love. We originally had a different working title for the book, but at a certain point in the process, uh, Lauren suggested, why don't we just use Empty the Pews? It's the perfect title. And I agreed and the publishers agreed that that would work very well and that it, uh, doing that, you know, it can be seen as an extension of the, uh, the hashtag movement, which has been used to highlight reasons to leave toxic churches. Uh, and so that's kind of what we did. And um, anyway, here's a slide that just kind of shows you my own life journey and also uh, empty the pews. And um, there's some praise for the book on this slide. I want to particularly highlight it. Um, to me, it's, it's really important to get religious people also to want to read this book and take it seriously and consider it. I mean, I know that the people is mostly about the hardline conservative Christians will not, but to get, you know, social justice pastors like Reverend Dr. Andre Johnson to, uh, to say that people in the church should read this book to me, that's that's really big. And that's an example of what I mean when I say that I think it's valuable for uh, atheists to do interfaith work. And I've done other things with him and I really appreciate him. So I was grateful to him for blurbing the book. And in case uh, this is too hard to read, uh, it says the essays that make up Empty the Pews can be instructive for us folks in the church. Um, so yeah, the book has been out since late 2019. Um, we've been trying to do some events to promote it. Uh, sales are modest so far, but we did get a review in the Washington Post, and I consider that, you know, another step in this long-term effort um, that I'm working on and supporting other people and working on of changing the way that um, conservative Christianity is discussed in the media. So, and I hope we're not done, you know, even though everything has kind of fallen by the wayside because of the pandemic, maybe we'll still get some more book reviews, uh, maybe through word of mouth. Uh, more people will start hearing about the book and, um, you know, it'll get out there. I also think that the essays could be used very well as primary sources um, for, let's say, a religious studies class, someone who's teaching the sociology of religion, where it's a very relevant fact uh, that the uh, the so-called nuns and O-N-E-S, or the non-religious population, has been rapidly on the rise since the 1990s, and that's particularly uh, you know, pronounced in uh, younger Americans. That's a, that's a major fact that um, religious studies courses should take into consideration. And so I think there's a number of college courses where this could actually make a, a decent textbook. And uh, I just want to put that out there in the hopes that maybe someone will uh, use that idea. But I think the book also is um, something that can be read by really anyone who has an interest in um, the topics, uh, topics like religion and secularization and secularism. Uh, and what's wrong with the Christian right in America today. Uh, as Tom said, the, uh, the, the contributors to the book, we very intentionally selected contributors who represent a diverse array of backgrounds, uh, racially and ethnically, culturally, uh, ex-Catholics, ex-Mormons, ex-evangelicals, um, people from different kinds of experiences, some growing up in the South, some growing up in you know, more rural areas and some in urban environments, some in immigrant communities and so forth. Uh, and the goal was kind of to create a sort of composite pic uh, picture of a very important phenomenon of our time, which is people leaving churches. Uh, so with that, I think I'll um, end the formal part of this presentation. I hope it didn't take too much time and I'll turn it over to Tom. Perfect. Are we able to go directly in? I know there were some technical technical issues. Are we able to go directly <laughs> into discussion? <laughs> I didn't want to yeah, jump into it. No, go ahead into discussion. I am going to remind everybody that if you have any questions, these these uh, Tom and Chris, you're going to have a little bit of a conversation. Um, before we get to your Q&A, but if you want to enter a question in the chat, it will come to me. Um, Chrissy, I'm going to ask you to unshare your screen so that I can mm -hmm. um, send you some potential 
information on how to turn your camera on, but if we can't fix it, <laughs> it'll be fine. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I apologize everybody that, um, you know, I've never used this software before, uh, and apparently no, it's not intuitive how, how to get this app to use your webcam on a Mac. So we've been trying to do that, and that's why we started late. <laughs> Yep, and and if you if you can't get it to work, I think it's going to be just fine. So we have some good <laughs> questions already queuing up, and if anybody has them, um, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. But before we do that, I wanted to take a quick sec second and ask folks in the audience because there was a question that I thought might be actually useful for this next part of your conversation to know the answer to. So the other option that you have in your little uh, side menu there is to raise your hand. And I'm curious how many people on the call are ex-evangelical themselves and are willing to just click raise your hand. It gives me a quick tally of how many folks on the call fall into that category. Excellent. I see you guys have found it. Good, good. So it looks like about 20% of you fall into that category. And I didn't know if that would be helpful to you guys in your conversation. Um, it was a question that somebody asked on the back end that I was like, oh, that actually might be useful to know when you're doing this, this conversation part. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Tom. Great, thanks, Sam. Well, Chrissy, thank you so much for uh, such a wonderful talk. Um, I do wanna say that when MD The Pew's um, Stories Living in Church first came out, I don't think I fully understood um, the import and uh, power of it before I sat down to read. Um, I had assumed that the subtitle Stories of Living the Church meant that these were essentially straight up narratives with a beginning and a middle and end. Um, but instead, and this is um, what I particularly enjoyed, uh, these essays, these, uh, these are essays that sort of use the contours um, and the setting of the real world to get, a, uh, to get across multiple points. Um, and many of them could even be uh, used as jumping off places um, for multiple uh, analytical articles, articles and perhaps even dissertations. Um, and at the same time, uh, these essays were a complete joy to read. Um, and the, the writing style made the philosophical, theoretical side much more palatable to me. Um, and in my opinion, this, is, this was uh, truly creative nonfiction at its best. Um, and I'm curious to know, was that intentional? Um, thank you very much, Tom. Um, yeah, so we kind of hashed out, you know, over the course of putting this together, what it was going to look like. Um, and I think there was broad agreement from early on that we were going to divide it up into uh, sections. And, you know, maybe I'll go ahead and just open the table of contents and tell everybody what those sections are. So there's a foreword by Frank Schaefer, who you may have seen on MSNBC. He's kind of a, a famous uh, older ex-evangelical. Um, but then the, the sections of the essays are purity, culture, sexuality, and queerness, focusing on the family, trauma and abuse in Christian contexts, American Christianity, diaspora, and missions, and intellectual odysseys. So we wanted to showcase, you know, different kinds of stories, different kinds of experiences, uh, and I wanted there to be a bit of a bit of organization to it, so it wasn't just a mishmash. And um, you know, the introduction to we were sort of thinking about, well, how scholarly should that be? Uh, and the part with all the statistics is the part that I wrote. And you know, um, the reason that it reads so smoothly is really Lauren's contribution, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, in that in that particular case, because um, I mean, Lauren is a brilliant writer, and uh, she and I, I think, had very good synergy on this book. Uh, in as much as, you know, she is more plugged into the literary world, I have been more plugged into the academic world, and I'm branching out into a number of, of different networks now. Uh, but, you know, I still am trained to think like an academic and a historian, and I think I originally had almost something like a, a Norton anthology in mind, if you're familiar with those. And Lauren's like, why do we need an apparatus? What do you even mean by that? So, you know, which is not to like is not in any way to insult Lauren because she's a really really smart person, uh, but I think at the end of the day like we both agreed she had certain priorities I had certain priorities that were shaped by our distinct backgrounds and they came together in something that I I do feel like struck the right balance in terms of you know being analytical versus uh, using compelling stories and I think 
those are precisely the two things, as we've already discussed, that it, that it takes to do effective advocacy. Right. And, and with, with that being said, um, with your love for uh, the, uh, analysis, what are your favorite contributions? Uh, yeah, well, it's, I always, I get this question a lot on podcasts and I answer it differently every time because I really do like a lot of the different essays for different reasons. Uh, some of them naturally resonate with me more than others just because of who I am in particular, you know, but um, I, I am really glad we included the whole section on um, diaspora and, and missions and the global reach of um, American style or American right-wing Christianity. Uh, one of my favorite essays, just because it kind of blew my mind, is Ruby Theagarajan's God the Investment Banker, uh, you know, where she talks about the American prosperity gospel, uh, American style mega churches in Singapore, and her experience of, you know, going to one of those churches as a kid and having these sermons on tape and all these books by American prosperity gospel charismatic preachers. Uh, so, you know, this kind of pernicious theology is having an impact in Singapore. I had no idea until, you know, she wrote to us and suggested, pitched, pitched her particular essay. I'm really glad that we accepted it. Um, there are some essays that I just really enjoy because uh, I just like the way they're written. And I would say I would put Peter Counters in that category. I mean, it's just, it's a super fun, geeky essay and his prose just flows so well. You know, it's, it's that one about, um, praying to uh, St. Michael, the archangel, to give him prowess in martial arts, right? And how that didn't work out. And so he ended up leaving Catholicism, um, for, I mean, for other reasons as well. But, you know, how he also learned that he could become uh, a skilled martial artist on his own without needing divine help. And it's just like, it's a fun, I think it's, it's a fun read. Um, Rebecca Matthews' essay, A Softer Answer, is very special to me because uh, she and I both went to the same Christian school, uh, Heritage Christian School. Oh. And um, she was a sophomore when I was a senior. I was editor in chief of the yearbook and she was on yearbook staff. So we actually worked with each other at that time. We're friends now. Uh, she in the meantime has published a couple of collections of lesbian short fiction that I really like um, and would recommend. Um, I also really like Jessica Powers essay about um, being in South Africa and, you know, the, meeting this kind of surfer dude there who has all of these charismatic and miracle and prosperity gospel beliefs and just writing about her encounter with him and how weird it was. So, yeah, I don't know. There's there's a whole lot of different stuff in there. <laughs> oh, certainly. I, I think my personal favorite is uh, A Better Dream by Isaac Marion, um, <laughs> which is probably the most uh, atheist of the bunch. Um, I really liked the um, discussion of leaving religion and, and essentially leaving behind one's friends and family members who want you to share in the delusion of religion. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, I noticed that the Washington Post in, it, um, in the review by, um, I think her name was Megan Mars, um, cited it as making the collection anti-religious in general. What did you, um, I guess, how did you, how did, what, uh, can you unpack, I guess, her review? Well, I don't know how much it's appropriate for me to talk about uh, a review of the book as one of the, the co-editors of the book, but I will talk about the issue of, is this an anti-religious book? Okay. Um, and I don't, I don't think that it is, you know, in the same way that I don't think that the hashtag is, even though some people will see it that way and some people will celebrate that and others will, uh, be hateful as, as, as a result of it. Um, I mean, overall, I just, I guess I just will say this. I think it was a positive review in the Washington Post and I'm really right. happy that it happened. So that was, that was nice. Um, but yeah, we, we thought that the uh, essay collection would end powerfully with what it really is the most anti-theist essay in the piece. Uh, but we didn't mean for that to, to uh, define the whole book. There's, there's an array of voices in the book and people don't all agree on things, right? So some of the contributors don't really know where they are with spirituality now. They don't necessarily not believe in anything metaphysical. Um, some of them actually say that they 
uh, don't, but they wish they could. There's a lot of ambiguity in these essays, right? And I think one thing that we wanted to capture is that leaving a uh, high demand religious community is hard. It's very, very hard to do. And so I think that a lot of atheists who have not experienced that don't don't understand how difficult it is because you lose your social support. You know, you may have had an, an education that was skewed by this particular religious ideology and you don't necessarily know how to function in the real world without that. But even if you got a decent education, you know, your entire network might be these kinds of conservative Christians and then how are you going to get a job? What are you going to do? Particularly if you're in a rural or a small town community. And then there's just also the issue of feeling like a traitor to your family and just of how powerfully we can be programmed when we're very young children. And of course, we want to think that our parents are the best people out there and everything that they believe is true. You know, so uh, I always kind of cringe when I see like online, and I mean online never, is uh, anonymous people online is, you know, never the best representative of, of any group. But when I see, you know, tweets by self-defined atheists saying that it's just stupid to believe these fairy tales, that's not true. Um, raw intelligence has absolutely nothing to do with whether people are religion, religious or not. Um, sociology tells us that things are, you know, much more complicated than that. So we wanted this book to be ambiguous, certainly not pro-religion, and certainly uh, highlighting many problems with uh, conservative Christianity. And we didn't really want to talk about a lot about, say, mainline or more liberal forms of Christianity, although Lauren came out of a mainline Presbyterian church and was still traumatized by hell doctrine and that sort of thing. I also really like her essay, uh, my co-editor's essay, Lauren O'Neill's essay. I think it has maybe the single most powerful line in the book in it, um, which is that, sure, the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself, but if Christianity teaches you to hate yourself, then you'll hate your neighbor as you hate yourself. Uh, you know, she really unpacks how she was raised with a kind of Christianity that led to serious self-deprecation. And I can relate to that. The same thing happened to me. I used to hate myself. And I didn't even understand why loving oneself would be good or even acceptable. I thought that that would be, you know, prideful. And <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, I don't think it's an anti-religious book. I think it's a book that just raises a lot of questions and issues. And yeah, I mean, there's even one person in the book, Rooney Wynn, who has come back around to a, a new, looser, social justice-oriented Christianity. And she actually asked us, do, I have to, do you think I, we should withdraw my contribution now? And we're like, no, we love it. So we're, we still want you to leave that in, you know? Your, your experience is still your experience and it's valid. So, yeah. I, I am interested. Um, you said that, um, you know, Isaac Marion's essay is not related to or it's not exactly the same as all of the other essays um, and I was curious about the framing of the Washington Post uh, review and, and if that's symptomatic of uh, other Washington Post reporters and New York Times reporters uh, during your presentation you talked about Elizabeth Diaz for example can you unpack that for us a little bit yeah media crit criticism I can do and um, again I'm, I'm not gonna like sort of go line by line through that review mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, I mean, to, su to suggest that Isaac Marion's um, essay is like the, the defining feature of the book, uh, I, I don't agree, but um, it does also mean something that we ended with it. And, you know, it's not, I mean, it, it, is, it is unique, but it's not the only essay uh, of, of a, it's, it's not the only contribution there of people who, no, you know, no longer have positive feelings about religion at all, right? So, right. Um, but yeah, we ended on that anti-theist note, I think, because he does present a kind of beautiful alternative, and it's a beautifully written analytical essay, and maybe less personal than most of them. But yeah, it's it, it's not it's not unique, and at the same time, it doesn't define the work as a whole because there is no agreement in the book as a whole about you know whether Christianity is still a valid thing for people to pursue in some ways. And I would personally take the stance that, yeah, there are healthy ways that you can do Christianity if you want to. And I will be mm -hmm. able to extend a hand with you uh, and work on issues like uh, LGBTQ rights and separation of church and state if we share those values, you know. Um, now, in terms of media criticism in general, yeah, I would say that the New York Times and the Washington Post are usually pretty bad in their coverage of evangelicals. Um, 
And there are, the, I mean, the main journalists who do this at those outlets, um, as you mentioned, Elizabeth Diaz, who's um, the head religion reporter at the New York Times, Sarah Pulliam Bailey in the Washington Post, the columnist Michael Gerson in the Washington Post, who was also a um, former George W. Bush speechwriter, worked closely with Karl Rove, drumming up alternative facts to, uh, you know, help us fight the Iraq war. Um, they are all evangelicals themselves. They are all graduates of the same evangelical college, Wheaton College in Illinois. And that is certainly a curious fact. Uh, I do think that it's irresponsible basically to let evangelicals cover themselves in a way that is not done with other religious groups and not to include dissenting voices because evangelicalism is often as controlling and as extreme as something like Scientology. So ex-evangelicals deserve a hearing in articles that cover evangelicalism. And I also think that it's really unfortunate that these major news outlets are sort of afraid of painting these kinds of religious communities as, as authoritarian as, as they are, because they are very repressive authoritarian communities to, to grow up in. They do not brook dissent in those communities. And so to let them basically, let evangelicals paint themselves as perfectly normal, uh, you know, yes, conservative, but definitely um, acting in good faith within a democratic system is, is simply false. This is an anti-pluralist, anti-democratic force. They will be fine with the, the visible trappings of democracy like elections, so long as they always win. But, you know, as soon as their, their power is actually threatened, they start cheating for the greater good <laughs> as they see it. <laughs> And, and the news just doesn't, I mean, the newspapers don't want to talk about that, let alone the cable news networks. Do you think there are essentially multiple versions of evangelicalism that, for example, the evangelicalism of Sarah Pulliam Bailey is the same as those who, let's say, vote, who are, you know, called, let's say, Trump evangelicals, for example? Uh, no, it's not the same. So, um, for statistical purposes, white evangelicals are usually treated as one demographic. And then, um, you know, there are some evangelicals of color, like there are uh, Latinx communities that would be defined as evangelical or Latinx churches within evangelical denominations. But there are also black Protestants who are usually treated as a separate category statistically uh, because they are shaped very, I mean, they're, they're very different in terms of how they've been shaped by sociological forces, right? And they vote very differently. So white evangelicals overall are Donald Trump's uh, single most supportive demographic and have consistently been that for this entire seemingly endless episode in American history. 80% um, of them, as is well known, voted for him in 2016. I'm sure at least 80% of the evangelical electorate will do so again. And the evangelical electorate is powerful for several reasons. Of course, gerrymandering and voter suppression, which is hard to do something about, but they also get out the vote. Um, so even though they have declined, well, so by the 2018 midterms, they were down to 17 or even maybe 16% of the population, depending on different surveys that you looked at around there, but they were still 25% of the electorate. So they get their people out there and they vote. Um, and so they've been very good at holding on to disproportionate power. But yes, they are not monolithic. 16% of them voted for Clinton. You know, so yay for that 16%. <laughs> so do, do you view uh, evangelical Christianity itself as a problem? Given I do. What you just described? I, I do, because while I uh, believe that there are, you know, there, there are different ways of being Christian and very, very different interpretations of the faith. Um, evangelical theology easily lends itself to authoritarianism. So I think with the particular ideas that evangelicals consider central to their faith, it's, it's hard. You have to kind of go against the grain of those ideas or the natural trajectory of those ideas to be someone who actually supports democracy and human rights. Now, some of them do it and it used to be more. So for example, you know, the kind of Jimmy Carter type Baptists who are very pro separation of church and state because they understand that it, uh, when, when you merge the church and the state, it corrupts both. They are still out there and they are often just wonderful people. There's a pastor that I really like um, who does a, a radio show called State of Belief Radio, Reverend Dr. Welton Gaddy. And he is just this kind of old school Jimmy Carter style Baptist, soft spoken, 
kindest man you ever want to meet. And he's let me talk very openly on his radio show about empty the pews, about being transgender. And so they are there, you know. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of lost track of the question. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, is it, a, is, it a, is it a problem itself? So, okay. So let's get so let's get back to the theology that most evangelicals do support. Um, they support either so-called biblical inerrancy uh, or some sort of slightly watered down version of that, like infallibility, the idea that the Bible is basically literally the word of God and everything in it is somehow true. There's not a single error in the Bible. Um, which obviously you cannot support unless you are willing to accept alternative facts. So that's a problem. Uh, they also believe in conversionism. That is, they believe exclusively that their understanding of Christianity is the only way to heaven and that they have a duty to try to convert other people. That's a viewpoint that does not lend itself well to pluralism on the whole. I mean, it's certainly... It's easier, I think, that if that's what you think, to have authoritarian politics than it would be to say, like, okay, I do think everyone should be a Christian, but you don't have to be, I don't, we can't force it. Uh, yeah, those people exist, again, but it's a little bit weird to me. Um, so yeah, I think evangelical theology is a problem. Some of it also, like, so-called penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, the idea that, um, you know, Jesus took our punishment is a very dark and anti-human sort of idea. There are other ways to understand the crucifixion and resurrection um, in liberation theology and queer theology and other kinds of theologies that are out there. But that's the evangelical understanding of the crucifixion. Um, and its I don't think it's a healthy way to think about things. And you've, you, know, you just mentioned your interest in pluralism. How do you balance those two aspects? You know, allowing pluralism to be as as wide as possible, but dealing with evangelical Christianity, which it's, is anti-pluralism. It's a tricky question. I mean, on a personal level or a kind of political and societal level. Um, but I have been very influenced by um, some of the 20th century philosophers of liberal liberalism who are out of fashion now, but people who were old enough to understand um, the Nazis very well and how something like that happens and who who uh, revived a kind of social contract theory. So I'm thinking of people like, you know, Karl Popper, Quentin Skinner, John Rawls, Sir Isaiah Berlin. Um, they all lived through some very violent periods in history. Uh, and they understood that uh, democratic societies can be destroyed from the inside if toleration extends to the intolerant. So where do you strike that balance? It's not an easy question, but I do think it's a question we should be talking about uh, and, and thinking about with respect to concrete issues like um, children's rights to an education, which children are deprived of in some religious communities. You know, the Amish, for example, since 1973, uh, the uh, Supreme Court case, Wisconsin v. Yoder, have been allowed to uh, educate their children only through eighth grade. Um, and today, as we already discussed, we have this situation where people can be sent to Christian schools, uh, not only with, with no choice or agency on behalf of the children who are sent to these schools, even though, you know, some of them by middle school are asking to be in public schools. I did, um, you know, but my parents could send me wherever they wanted. They're not only just able to do that, but they get state and federal funding to do it now so that uh, the tuition is not a barrier like it used to be for a lot of people. Uh, which means a lot of kids are getting funneled into extremist Christian schools and they have no say in the matter or faith healing communities. You know, I don't think that um, parents should have the right to deprive their children of life saving health care uh, out of their own religious objections. You know, let the kids decide for themselves when they're 18. But I think they should be tried under the same neglect and abuse laws as everybody else. But, you know, there are there are there are fuzzier issues where it might be harder to hash things out. And, and what are some of those issues? Hmm. You don't mind asking. <laughs> well, so you know the whole the whole <laughs> issue of leads. schools, the whole issue of schools and and homeschooling and private schooling, I think, is a tricky one. So I think the obvious point there is we should not be providing state and federal funding for religious instruction, and in fact, in in many cases, indoctrination. Uh, but does that mean 
there should be no private schools or there should be no provision for religious instruction in private schools. And I would not go that far, but I would like to see, you know, I would like to see some um, legal recognition of children's rights to some agency over their own education. Uh, I would like to see Wisconsin v. Yoder overturned, and I'm not alone in that. Uh, you know, Tora Bontrager, who founded the Amish Heritage Foundation, she's amazing. She uh, ran away from home after eighth grade because she wanted to continue her education, and she was also escaping from severe abuse. She went to live with an uncle who had also left the Amish, and, um, you know, she is advocating for um, Wisconsin v. Yoder to be overturned, and I, I wish her the best with that, and I've been able to work with her in some capacities. Uh, so, you know, I think um, a balance needs to be struck. I think homeschooling needs to be regulated. Uh, and right now it's it's up, it's practically unregulated. It's been deregulated since the 1980s because uh, Christian right organizations have mobilized to deregulate it effectively. And so they're basically allowed to um, indoctrinate and even abuse and neglect children with impunity because nobody checks. And I think if you're going to homeschool, you should have to meet uh, certain state standards. I also think that if you are a religious school, uh, you know, you should you should also be have you should also have to meet certain universal standards. And I don't think you should be allowed to have uh, a registered AP biology course if your instructor is going to spend half the class time rambling about the apocalypse. I'm not making this up. And oh. and refuse to teach us the evolution chapters. But he did tell us, you know. Now go read them on your own and regurgitate them for the exam, because apparently lying for Jesus is okay. You know, they, uh, I, I was on what I call the elite culture warrior track. They want us to to, to accrue um, academic success and business success and so forth, so that we can you know use it for the good of the cause, right? But you're never supposed to. You get some. You actually get some critical thinking skills. You get some credentials. You're never supposed to turn the skills that you get back around on the faith itself. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so yeah, I Sounds mean, like I think you know, I, I think there we talk about regulation. We don't talk about an outright ban. Is is where I see the line. But I also see that being a tricky issue where it would be great if we could all kind of publicly deliberate in good faith about things like that, good faith, so to speak. Yeah, completely. Um, I do not want to completely take up this time with my questions, so I think we should turn to uh, the questions in the chat. Sam? Yeah, and honestly, um, you you have managed to cover a bunch of them <laughs> <laughs> that had come in, and a couple of people were like, did that answer your question? They're like, yep, that's pretty much what I was asking. So, But I do have a couple in here that are pretty interesting that I definitely want to get to. Um, the one that I'm going to ask first is sort of the next logical step of where do you see exposed Christian schools and empty the pews movements going in the future? And that's sort of a, a sandwich question with another one that is related in what does the movement look like now? So is there a component of this movement that is not on Twitter, not on Instagram and offline? Are there conferences, are there meetings, are there online spaces that people can connect to? Some of us have been talking about wanting to put together a convention or, or something like that for several years. Uh, Exvangelicon has been the um, you know punny suggested title that's been been going around. But there's a lot of distance between a, a lot of um, the people who are known in the community, and um, most of us do not have a great deal of money to fund things like this, you know. So that is kind of stalled. We did have a panel discussion. Uh, in Clearwater, Florida, a couple of years ago. And um, there are some small local groups that just gather uh, and talk. Um, there's an evangelical group on Facebook that's a, a support group um, moderated on the principles of intersectional feminism. So, you know, it's a safe space. It's, it's not for people who want to have nothing to do with safe spaces, but it still has um, 7,000 members. And it now has a number of offshoots and subgroups as well to focus on different things of interest to different people in the community. And one that we're doing is a book club. And I think we might be able to extend that book club and the virtual book club meetings that we're going to start having to people outside the specific uh, private Facebook group where that happens. Um, so we might see that. And I've been working a lot on my writing and also just kind of preoccupied by um, 
going through gender transition in recent years. Uh, well, really like the last couple of years, year and a half, I guess. Um, and, you know, some other things kind of happened in my life that derailed me from doing much with, with hashtags, though I have been promoting the book um, since it came out. Uh, but I would definitely be interested in conferring with some people to organize new campaigns. Um, so hopefully that can happen. Um, and yeah, another thing that I do, per, that I personally do just behind the scenes is cultivate relationships with journalists. You know, sometimes um, a journalist gets in touch with you and they kind of just want to pick your brain for information or talk to you, or you think maybe they're going to quote you in an article, maybe, maybe they won't. Or they're like, I have an interest in writing this kind of article, or I have an interest in writing about this group of people. I don't know when I'm going to do it. You know, that can be frustrating, but um, I just build relationships with journalists over time, and sometimes it bears fruit years after we first started chatting. Um, so, you know, that's something that um, that some other people are able to do as well. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly, but I hope it's going somewhere. <laughs> and then a sort of related question was. Did you have any surprising perspectives and insights like before and after in terms of certain ideas or concepts in your process of gathering stories for from the hashtag and then for the book after that? Mm. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And um, I'd say, yeah, I have been surprised by some stories, uh, maybe by others not, by, by most I would say maybe not so much, but sometimes just the the extreme severity of say sexual abuse that has happened in some evangelical communities or fundamentalist communities uh, is beyond what I initially even understood or expected would would be there, or the the fact that you know fundamentalist white Christians in America still have a serious child marriage problem is something I was not that was not really on my radar screen when uh, I first started talking about these issues, but it makes perfect sense with the kind of hardcore patriarchal um, religion that evangelical Protestantism is. And, you know, it's evangelical Protestantism is a spectrum of, you know, extreme extreme to quote unquote respectable extreme, right? And I grew up with the res uh, on the respectable extreme end of that uh, spectrum. But that being said, I mean, there's still uh, one of the, one of the teachers I actually had in high school was arrested and convicted for um, was sexual misconduct with a minor. Um, there was a missionary doctor in one of the churches that I attended as a kid who would go and provide medical care in Panama, and it turned out that he was uh, molesting all kinds of girls while he was doing that. Um, so, you know, it was all around me and even the more extreme stuff. And I think that, you know, to get back to what we were talking about in the media, people like Sarah Pulliam Bailey, it's all around her too. And she doesn't want to know that. Or, you know, maybe that's unfair, but I, I, I get the sense that she doesn't want to face that because the, the so-called, or what I called respectable end of the evangelical spectrum enables the really hardcore extremists. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a problem. That was honestly my next question. The next question was, why do you think the mainstream media is so reluctant to do honest reporting on evangelical Christianity? So you sort of touched at that at the end of your last answer. Yeah, though there are some other factors that I haven't exactly touched on. Uh, and that would be that, um, so people who run a newsroom, they generally don't come from or even understand evangelical subculture or middle America or the South. Uh, it's a foreign world to them. And so it's partly a, a, you know, good impulse that they want to, in some ways, tread lightly. But on the other hand, I think that there is also a cowardly element of this when they're kowtowing to the right-wing outrage machine. If everyone just stopped caring about bad faith arguments from coming from the 4chan to Fox pipeline, you know, and we just decided we're not going to coddle them anymore, we're going to print facts and they can yell about it all they want you know, then they would stop having the impact that they have. I mean, 4chan and Fox. Um, but no, everyone's afraid of Tucker Carlson. And, you know, there is also the, the, the factor that among um, Jewish reporters, 
there's a real fear of being represented as um, anti-Christian and that fueling anti-Semitism. And that actually, I mean, that is a serious concern. That, that's a concern that, that does have to be taken seriously. Um, you do sometimes see, you know, in the situation with Dan Levin from the New York Times, for example, um, if if it's if there's something that trolls can run with to say, oh look, it's a Jewish reporter smearing Christians, um, they will, and then they'll get into all these stereotypes about Jewish controlled media and so on and so forth. So that's a, that's another tricky thing. But the solution is not is certainly not just to let evangelicals cover themselves, you know, um, just diversify the the people that you represent in the coverage and the people who do the coverage and stop being afraid of the right-wing outrage machine. Hard thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Easier said than done, I have to admit. It's, it's somewhat easy, uh, you know, for me to be on the sidelines here and uh, tell the New York Times what to do, but it's okay because they won't listen anyway. <laughs> So we had a couple different questions that were related to um, evangelicalism and white supremacy. And this one is, are ex-evangelicals struggling to leave their white supremacist beliefs when they leave their abusive religion? And are they able to shed those two things simultaneously? And that's probably something you could speak for like another hour on, but um, <laughs> and, and well, we'll and, go with that. You know, it would be it would be better if we could have an ex-evangelical of color talk about that, or we could have a dialogue about it. Um, but it certainly is a, an issue uh, that when many people deconstruct the faith, um, you know, they don't immediately understand um, how a, a lot of things that there are still just kind of knee-jerk impulses for them are racist or sexist. And there is a lot of work to do on that as well. So, in the evangelical uh, Facebook group, we discuss anti-racism a lot and how to be a good ally and how to become anti-racist. And there are some POC in there, but it is an overwhelmingly white group because this is an overwhelmingly white kind of Christianity. And it is absolutely, you know, um, just, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of inextricably intertwined, let's say, with the history of white supremacism and the present realities of white supremacism in America. Um, so yeah, there's a whole lot left to learn when you leave it uh, to start, you know, understanding how to advocate for justice, including racial justice. Um, and there's a lot of white fragility to kind of work through to learn that, you know, it's not the end of the world to be called out, to be corrected, to listen and learn from someone who is offended by something that you said. Um, in white conservative communities, we're acculturated to be afraid of open conflict or open criticism, you know, which actually works very nicely to uphold white supremacism. Uh, so we have to be willing to be corrected, to learn, to be wrong. And uh, one thing that I like to say in general, um, is that there are no shortcuts to being a good person. So, and I see this as a problem in both religious communities and sometimes in the atheist movement as well, that sometimes we think, okay, I now believe the right ideas, I am good, I have arrived, and we become emotionally invested in this sense of being a good person, rather than working on being a good person and understanding that you're never gonna perfect it. Uh, so, because we become emotionally invested in the idea of being a good person, we get defensive when, you know, we're challenged on things that we could improve on. And it's just the wrong mentality. Being a good person is always something that we work on. There are some beliefs and ideas that make it harder to be a good person than other beliefs and ideas. That is true. But patriarchy, for example, and white supremacy also exist outside religion. And um, if we're not willing to look at that, then we're probably missing certain blind spots in our, in our own lives. Good answer. I'm going to ask one more question, and um, and then we'll probably wrap it up for the night. And I'll, I'll give you a chance to say any closing thoughts. And this one's one that is another one that I'm not sure that we can answer all in one evening and one hour. But it basically is: Do you see us and yourself winning the war against organized religion? I personally <laughs> don't think there's a chance for American atheists to do this right now. What's your take on it? 
and what would we need to do as a community to move things forward? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I don't see myself as at war with organized religion. Right. I see myself as, you know, fighting uh, still very large, but smaller, perhaps more manageable battles. But yes, to be, to put it quite frankly, and to just be sober and upfront, we are losing. Um, I, I visited the, um, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter uh, in Kentucky. Um, when was that? About a year ago with um, University of North Florida Religious Studies professor Julie Ingersoll. Uh, we went to observe. You know, I took a lot of uh, pictures and video. I posted them on Twitter. And at a certain point, um, as we were walking through this giant, and I, and I put this in quotation marks, replica of uh, Noah's Ark, right, with all kinds of bizarro theories and alternative facts about how Noah could have had every biblical kind on the ark, um, and you know, like dinosaurs and cages, animatronic dinosaurs, of course. But you know, um, it's it, it's so ridiculous. Uh, but um, you know, you look at these these Christians, mostly white Christians, walking around in this theme park masquerading as a museum, and they're really enthralled, and they're like, oh, so that's how they they fit these dinosaurs on the ark or whatever. And uh, you know, just observing that. Um, Julie said, trying to remember exactly how she phrased it, she said, we've lost or, or something like that. I mean, she was just in despair because we do have such a serious problem with information literacy and disinformation and political power structures that prop up uh, the indoctrination in uh, disinformation and alternative facts. And, you know, that's not only harmful for the advancement of science and fighting things like climate change, which it is, but of course, I mean, it's also harmful to uh, to people on a, on a number of levels and and to marginalized people uh, who are othered by these uh, far right wing Christians. Um, I think that we do need to be willing to work with uh, Christians who are oriented toward social justice and who do not reject science. Um, they they are out there. Some of them are my good friends. Uh, and uh, we're not going to win any war without them. Uh, so I think that, you know, focusing on on pluralism as kind of a defining feature of democracy and how we can all live together under the same social contract with separation of church and state, uh, but accommodating different kinds of people uh, so long as they also agree to that. I think that's good. And, you know, the evangelicals, most of them fall outside of that so long as they also agree to this social contract because they're trying to achieve domination. They're not trying to achieve equality. So equality for all in the public square, plus a, a good accessible education system that doesn't fail our children on science. Um, I think those, those things are important. I, I know firsthand that there are a lot of Christians, usually not in evangelical denominations, with some exceptions, uh, who agree with me. And um, I think that to win the smaller battles, we need them on our side. So that's why I really don't, I, I really don't like or do anti-theism because I think it's counterproductive. I, I understand where people are coming from with that, but uh, like the, the anger that we might feel at what's being done to our society by right-wing Christians or at, uh, abuse or trauma that we experienced growing up is absolutely valid. And I understand it. Uh, but it's also simply not true that all organized religion is the same. I mean, um, most uh, most American Muslims, for example, 80%, as far as I recall from a recent survey I saw, I think it was 2018 data, support same-sex marriage. Uh, you know, with evangelicals, white evangelicals, it's almost flipped the other way around in terms of opposition to same-sex marriage. So um, we have to we have to direct our ire where it's going to do and our energy where it's gonna do the most work, you know? And, and also Judaism uh, is a faith where you can actually be practicing and religious and not believe in God. So religion isn't always defined as, as atheists often want to define it as belief in supernatural phenomena. Most sociologists of religion don't define religion that way at all. They see it more as like a set of, you know, community structures and, and rituals which uh, bind people together and help them navigate meaning in life. Um, sometimes that comes with belief in the supernatural. Sometimes it, it does not, or it's a mixed bag. And um, sometimes the belief in the supernatural 
really isn't harmful or isn't especially harmful, you know, because it's not all belief in talking snakes and magic apples. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, I understand that my faith is outside science. I think there's a, a benevolent force behind the universe and, you know, okay, I don't see that, but that's, a, I, you know, you're not hurting me by believing that. So why do I really want to throw it in your face when we can actually work towards the same goals? Yeah, so we had a comment come in while you were talking that says politics makes for strange bedfellows, question mark. And I think that <laughs> yes, that's something yes, that does. we've stressed in our activism with American Atheists is that sometimes we're aligning our values with folks who who maybe don't hold the same beliefs and that's okay. Um, and so we try to we try to make sure that we're doing that out there in the field when we're working on different issues, like you mentioned, child marriage and things like that. So um, mm -hmm. so with that, I'm going to Toss it back over to Tom for a minute, and then um, we'll do some housekeeping at the end since we're running short on time. But I just want to apologize again for the technical difficulties, but um, it was wonderful to have you here. Thanks. It's been great. Uh, it's, it's been great being here. Yeah, th thank you, Chrissy, for uh, taking the time uh, to, to give a presentation, uh, answer my questions, and also answer uh, the questions of others. Um, how can we keep track of all that you're doing on social media and stay plugged into your work, um, including your uh, articles? Uh, thanks, Tom. So I'm a regular contributor right now to Religion Dispatches and uh, also to The Conversationalist. So most of my new work that's coming out is gonna be in those places. Um, on Twitter, I am at, at sign C underscore Stroop, S-T-R-O-O-P. Um, and I can be contacted through my website, cstroop.com, uh, where also you can sometimes see updates about uh, things that I've recently been up to or upcoming events. Um, currently, there's not a whole lot in the upcoming events department, you know, given the pandemic and, and all of that. Um, so that section of my website has not recently been updated. Um, but hey, I actually should have put I should have put this event on it. But this, this all came up kind of fast. <laughs> Um, but in any case, yeah, sometimes I do update things on my website. <laughs> and uh, for the audience, we did put in the chat the, your website and also your Twitter handle and also the link to the book so that if you are interested in picking up a copy, um, you, can, you can follow that link and get your own copy. I do want to also mention that Chrissy's uh, story is the cover story of American Atheist magazine for this last issue that was sent out to our members. And if you are interested in getting our magazine, of course, go to atheist.org and become a member and you get our awesome magazine that features amazing works from all of our um, speakers from our convention. That's where our series, series is right now. And from many other people, including our state directors and volunteers across the country. So that is at atheist.org. Um, and once again, Chrissy, I want to just thank you for being here and remind everybody that this was recorded. We will send it out and you will be able to access it. I will make sure that I include in the follow-up email these links that I dropped into the Q&A in case you can't find them so that you can stay on top of what Chrissy is doing and, and make sure that you stay updated with her amazing work. Thank you so much, Sam and Tom. It's really been uh, wonderful to get to kick off this summer series with you. And I look forward to uh, the other talk.